If you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along, we are uh, in the eighth chapter of the book of Joshua, which is the sixth book in the Bible, uh, reading beginning with number verse 30. Next week we are uh, going to be reading chapter 9, and then uh, the first Sunday in December is the first Sunday in Advent. And um, our, our theme, we're going to take a break from Joshua, our theme for, uh, for Christmas is going to be, um, I'm not sure how we're going to title it yet, but maybe Color Me Christmas. We're going to look at different colors uh, that represent the Christmas season, whether it's red, green, blue, white, things like that. So I also know that um, the Christmas season and the Easter season are the two major times when people uh, who have been away from any kind of worship want to come back. A great, great opportunity to invite people. You can do that anytime. Uh, but uh, Christmas and Easter are, are two of the big times. So keep in mind some folks that you might want to invite uh, to come and worship with you. This is uh, Joshua chapter 8, verse 30. And Joshua built on Mount Ebal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites. He built it according to what was written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool had been used. On it they offered to the Lord burnt offerings and sacrificed fellowship offerings. There in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua copied on stones the law of Moses, which he had written. All Israel, aliens and citizens alike, with their elders, officials, and judges, were standing on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, facing those who carried it, the priests who were Levites. Half the people stood in, Mount, in front of Mount Gerizim, and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had formerly commanded when he gave instructions to bless the people of Israel. Afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel, including the women and children and the aliens who lived among them. Amen. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 27, uh, you read where, where Moses is an old man and... Um, just a second. There we go. You read where Moses is an old man and it's time for him to die. Now Moses had, had led these people for uh, 40 years, and, but God told him that he was not going to be entering the promised land. He's going to stand on Mount Nebo, and he's going to look over the promised land, but he will never enter it. But Moses gathers all the leaders, and, and that includes Joshua, and he says, when you get into the promised land and you conquer some cities and you've gotten to the center of the promised land, before you do anything else, build an altar and write on the stones the law that I received from God and rededicate yourselves as the people of God. That's our text for the morning. <laughs> So the people have reached Ebal and the valley of Shechem and, and there's, a, there's a great altar and it's, in, it's constructed and the people of God have come to renew the covenant that they had made. Now this valley, this valley of Shechem has a lot of history. Uh, 450 years before that is where God promised Abraham that Every single place where you put your feet is going to be yours. That's the promised land. This is the valley where Jacob had his fantastic dream of angels ascending and descending on a ladder. And later on we're going to be looking at, at, at some other things that happened in this valley. But, but it's in this valley between Shechem and Ebal that the people of God come together to renew the covenant that had been made. There's a guy by the name of John Stanton 
And he was pastor of the Johnstown Westmont Presbyterian Church a number of years ago. And he said, I became a Christian after almost 25 years in the ministry. What's interesting is he called a guy by the name of Gypsy Smith to come to the war memorial to come and to preach. And he went to the funeral home in town. I don't know which one that was. And he rented chairs and he set them up himself because none of the other local pastors would help. So Gypsy Smith came and Stanton sat in the back of the building and he wept and accepted Christ. And at that point is when his ministry took off. Gypsy Smith was a very colorful preacher. And he was once asked how to bring about revival. And, and he said, you go home, you lock your bedroom door, you lay on the floor, and you take chalk, and you draw an outline of your body, and you say, oh God, bring revival here. That's what the children of God were doing in the valley. They were, they were drawing a chalk line, and they were saying, God, do it again. We will renew the covenant, and please revitalize the life that has been here for 400 years. During the Civil War, there was a, a man who was pushing a cart up a hill in the, in the southern troops. And a chaplain decided that it was time to witness to this man. And so he said, sir, do you know Jesus? And the guy who was pushing the cart said, I'm trying to get the cart up the hill. This is no time for riddles. That's really not time for riddles, but this was really not a time for reaffirmation in the valley either because they're involved in a major military campaign. And, but I would suggest to you that this was the best time. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to give you five reasons as to why this was the best time. The first is this. In a pluralistic country or culture, there's a necessity for definition. Now, from Deuteronomy chapter 27 to the end of Deuteronomy, this is where Moses gives instructions about the incident that we're looking at this morning. Here's what it says in verse 9 of chapter 27. Moses and the Levitical priests said to all Israel, Be silent, Israel, and listen, you have now become the people of the Lord your God. President Eisenhower once said, Democracy cannot survive without a commitment to religion. And that was good. But then he said this. But I don't care which one it is. Tolerance is good. But there's a danger in tolerance. It becomes simple-minded. It becomes bland pluralism. I believe that that's one of the dangers of our former denomination. It was so easy to be like the world in practice because of convenience. Our finances or, or practice so much so that the people of God are no longer defined as the people of God. We are different from the world or we are to be different from the world. We are different from other denominations and religions. We, I'm not Lutheran. I'm not Catholic. I'm not Muslim. I'm not Buddhist. I have serious problems with all those. Otherwise, I would have been one of those. What we're doing, what they're doing in the Valley of Shechem, between Ebal and Gerizim, is that they're saying, we are not the same. We are different. I believe that, that the greatest danger that, that we face as Christians is that we are accepted. We fit in. That's extremely dangerous. 
Our citizenship is not here. We're, we're going to another place. And if you start feeling like you fit in, then you get down to Shechem. And there's an altar there. And you get on your knees and you say, remind me who I am. Secondly, God required a renewal of the covenant because in a chaotic life, there is the necessity of remembering. It says in verse 30, Joshua built on Ebal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel. Have you ever noticed in this book um, the phrase that gets repeated a few times? Here's this phrase. These stones are here to this day. These stones are here to this day. For instance, let me, let me show you. I'm gonna, I'll read these to you. It says, And they raised a large pile of rocks over it, which remains to this day. Uh, Joshua set up, um, over, I'm sorry, over Achan they piled up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are here to this day. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a permanent heap of ruins, a desolate place to this day. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, so this place has been called Gilgal to this day. You see the pattern? Remembering, remembering, remembering. Don't forget. In Krakow, Poland, at dusk, <clears throat> every night, a trumpet is blown. And at the end of the trumpet being blown, the last note is broken up like, like he's having problems playing the trumpet. Interestingly enough, that's been going on for over 700 years. Now, why is that? <clears throat> well, 700 years ago, the Tartars tried to sweep into Poland, and, and a young man who was a bugler warned the city. And on the last note, he was shot with an arrow, and he could not complete it. Why? Well, they remember. They do this to remember. Keep in mind, keep in mind the people who have died for you. You know, Jesus was so wise. <clears throat> you know, when we have the sacrament of communion, we have the, the bread and we have the cup. And Jesus said, when you take this bread, remember that this bread was, represents my body, which was broken for you. Remember that. And he said, the cup, take this cup and remember that this cup is a representative of my blood. Remember, every time you take the bread and take the cup, remember that I died for you. We are called to remember every single time we take communion. He says, remember the day that I called you. Don't forget. Do you take time to remember? We live in such a hectic world. You know, we, we, we leave this place, we hop in the car, we got to get home to go do something or maybe not do anything, but we have to hurry up and get in the car or we, we have to get home and we hurry to wait. And many times we don't remember things. I have... I have a digital uh, photo thing. I don't know what you call it, a frame. Any of you know what I mean? You, have, you ever have those? And on that digital photo frame are pictures of Cheryl that just continually come like every six or seven seconds. And her picture's on my computer. Um, it, her picture's on my nightstand. I think about wedding pictures and, and trips that we would take and, and, and kids' pictures and things that we did with the kids. Churches where we serve, nights out together, it's, it helps me to remember. If you have a hard time remembering, remember the one who loves you and called you. And there's an altar down in Shechem. You go down there and you get on your knees and ask the Father to help you remember. 
It's the third thing. God also required it because in a hard calling, there's a necessity of rededication. <clears throat> this is in Deuteronomy chapter 30, two verses. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. So that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I don't know a lot of science. I got a young son who knows more about science than, than anybody I know. I don't know a lot about science. But I do know about the second law of thermodynamics. Are you impressed? <clears throat> Say yes. <clears throat> okay. And the second law of thermodynamics is this. As things get older, they run down and they fall apart. You think that's, you, you question that? Look at your bodies. <clears throat> you buy a car, it doesn't get better as it gets older, it falls apart. Look at your house. Your house falls apart as it gets older. I go back to your bodies again. Look at your bodies. As we get older, we have a tendency to fall apart. I know that, but, but catch this. <clears throat> Commitment runs down too. You can't run today's commitment on yesterday's gasoline. I need to continually rededicate my life. We always, we always do the easy way. But if I get down to Shechem... <clears throat> there's an altar there and I kneel before the altar and I remember that I need to rededicate today here's a fourth reason it's that God required the renewal of the covenant because in an immoral culture it's necessary to reaffirm here's verse 34 of chapter 8 Afterward, Joshua read <clears throat> all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it was written in the book of the law. One of the reasons, one of the reasons for anti-Semitism before the body of Christ was formed is the obedience of the Jews to the law of God. And that made them different. When Christ came, he said that he did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. It, it's, it is still the mind of God. God still has views on adultery and integrity and honesty and love. And that's never changed. If you blow it, you can be forgiven. And he'll give you the grace to live out that law. But the law was there. And, and, and they were different because of the law. We should be different as well. The morality in our society can begin to permeate our lives. And we can't let that happen. Because the law should make you different. And if you find your life is like Joe Pagan or Jane Sinek, there is still an altar down in Shechem. And go down there and kneel. And be different. Finally, God required the renewal of the covenant because in a cerebral religion, there's a necessity for emotion. Let me read you verses 32 and 33. <clears throat> Here in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua wrote on stones a copy of the law of Moses. All the Israelites, with the elders and officials and judges, were standing on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, facing the Levitical priests who carried it. Both the aliens living among them and the native-born were there. Half the people stood in front of Mount Gerizim, and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had formally commanded when he gave instructions to bless the people of Israel. No other faith, no other faith, appeals to more folks than the Judeo-Christian faith. You can be a Christian intellectually, but if you are only that, then you've missed it. 
Don't miss what's happening in this section of Scripture. The valley of Shechem was filled with great emotion. Abraham, 450 years before that, was told that this land was his. These people know that. It's here that Jacob sees these angels going up and down a ladder. These people knew that. And on the right, there's Mount Ebal, and it's, it's barren, and it's rocky. It's, a, it's, a dry, it's an awful mountain. And on the other side, there's Gerizim, and it's, it's green, and it's lush, and it's wooded. One side's for cursing, the other side for blessing. This valley is a natural amphitheater. The valley is only two miles across. But 600,000 people filled that valley around the Ark of the Covenant. 300,000 on one side, 300,000 on the other. And Joshua reads, and the people respond, Amen. And they shout, Amen. This valley is at the heart of the promised land. And if their shouting didn't move you, you were sick. Emotionalism is not good. Emotion is absolutely necessary. Crying in church? I'm discovering that that's not a bad thing at all in the life of a believer. So I need to be careful that my heart doesn't grow cold. And I need to go to Shechem and kneel down and ask God to warm it up again. Let me say one more thing. <clears throat> Rahab, the prostitutes in this crowd, she was on the blessing side. She was remembering how God called and saved her from her lifestyle and choices. She remembered. So what can you remember? I mentioned to you about Jacob's ladder, but did you also know that Jacob's well was there? 1,500 years later, Jesus met another prostitute. And here's what it says in John chapter 4. Jesus answered, whoever drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. You get down to Shechem between Ebal and Gerizim. There's an altar there. And there's a well there. And he still waits. Let's pray. Father, help us to realize the importance of dedicating or rededicating our lives to you. We can't rely on mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles and our kids, our spouses, our best friends. This is something that we need to do individually because commitment leaks. And because of commitment leaking, we need to rededicate ourselves. We need to continually come before you so that our, our hearts, our, our spirits, our, our lives are energized so that we can become the people that you want us to be on a continual basis. We are different from the rest of the world. And that's a good thing. And so we ask that 
the witness that we have and the life that we live would be a vibrant, exciting life. Because it's a life that's filled with you. So we ask that you'd bless us this day. <clears throat> As we look forward to Thanksgiving, we, we give thanks for the life that you offer to us when we put our trust in you. May this day be a day of great rejoicing because there's an altar and a well. And you wait for us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand for the benediction? <clears throat> Let's pray together. Father, help us to kneel before you to accept who you are, to give thanks for who we are because of you, that you'd take us from this place, that we might serve you and serve others because of your great love. This we ask in Jesus' name. And the church believing that said, Amen. Amen. See you next week.
go. Move those candles out, please. Thank you. Send me a drip on you can't, can't even do your job. Can't even do your job. Hey. 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 Hey.